This is Historical Hotties, a podcast where we go through different categories of historical figure and try and figure out which one is the biggest babe. Hello and welcome again to Historical Hotties. In the game of Historical Hotties, you pick the biggest babe or you die. I'm your host, Whitney Nelson, and this is your co-host, Lindsay Nelson. And in this episode, we are talking about the real life inspirations for Game of Thrones. Now, George R. R. Martin has said that his favorite sort of fiction is historical fiction, but that the problem with historical fiction is that everybody knows how the story end. So it's pretty widely speculated that Game of Thrones is loosely based on the War of the Roses. Some examples of this are the wall that separates the Kingdom of the North from the Wildlands Beyond is based on Hadrian's Wall, um, and the Andals, who first separated Westeros into seven kingdoms, are a reference to the Anglo-Saxons, who separated England into seven kingdoms. But specifically, the war between the Starks and the Lannisters also bears big similarities to the War of the Roses, which was between the English houses of Lancaster and York between about 1445 to 1487. Like the Starks, the House of York is Northerners, and like the Lannisters, the House of Lancaster were Southerners and very wealthy. The parallels don't just end there. A lot of the struggle has to do with sort of a power void that was left and a bunch of people fighting for the throne, but primarily these two houses saying that they have a claim for it. So uh, there's several historical figures that really existed that have pretty similar parallels to the characters in Game of Thrones. So that's where we are starting out. And Lindsay, who is your pick? And tell us a little bit about them and who they inspired. Inspired on the show. Well, my pick is Margaret of Anjou, and she is a pretty likely inspiration for Cersei Lannister. And while I don't find Cersei particularly attractive, I find the actress who plays her very attractive, I think there's a lot to recommend Margaret in that a lot of the Cersei like characteristics were some real strong Yorkist and Tudor propaganda. (laughs) They called her the French she-wolf and spread all these rumors about her cruel and barbaric behavior. One of the also real strong reasons why she is a likely Cersei inspiration is her son is a very strong Joffrey parallel in that he was a little blonde-haired 13-year-old boy who couldn't stop talking about wars and not being able to wait until he could behead people. So... (laughs) Definitely getting some Joffrey vibes from him. But Margaret of Anjou was born in France, um, March 23rd, 1430. And she came from a family with very strong, powerful, political, savvy women in it. Her father was known as the king with many crowns and no kingdom because he had claims to about five kingdoms, but had a hard time being placed in charge of any of them. And his wife really, uh, Margaret's mother, really did a lot of political maneuvering to get him put in charge of Naples, which was one of the territories that he had claimed to rule. Margaret married Henry VI of England, and she was kind of part of a peace treaty between France and England, who'd been scuffling for a long time in the Hundred Years' War over who really owned France, which royal family was the rightful king of France. And as part of a peace treaty, her uncle to marry the king to cement ties and was known as like the bride of peace. Unfortunately, uh, Henry VI was a pretty weak king. He'd been king since he was a baby, but was controlled by all of these regents because his parents had died, which is why he was king as a baby. And he grew up kind of never really fighting their control and never getting to a point when he was older where he really fought back against it, sort of took control of the kingship and had his regent step aside. And there's also lots of talk about him having some mental and physical problems. He did have some bouts of insanity and stuff like that. Margaret largely took control of the kingdom when she became queen. And a lot of the beginning of the War of the Roses was struggles between her and a couple of dukes who wanted to take control, mostly because... A, they wanted power and were used to having it, and B, they were not super wild about a woman taking control of the kingdom. That is my pick for my 
historical inspiration hottie, Margaret of Anjou. Okay, so my pick is Thomas Cromwell, who is a pretty straight comparison to Peter Baelish, also known as Littlefinger. Like Cromwell, Baelish is not a highborn man. He used a lot of guile and skill and keeping a firm grip on the kingdom's purse strings and a lot of whispering in ears to work his way into the king's service. For almost five centuries since Cromwell's death, historians have kind of cast him in this sort of scheming vulture sort of role but does that characterization really do him justice? He definitely he emerged from you know back alleys in a rural part of town. His father was basically a thug. Uh, His family ran a brewery and eventually he became Earl of Essex one of the oldest noble titles in the realm but he had a pretty big downfall in the end. So his father not only had about five jobs of being a blacksmith and a brewer and a tavern owner and a fuller. His name appears 48 times that we know of on manor court rolls for misdemeanors, everything from watering down his beer to assaulting his neighbors. So that's the kind of atmosphere that Thomas Cromwell grew up in. Young Cromwell is, by his own admission later on, kind of a ruffian himself in his teenage years, does not get along with his father, and his father may have had him put in jail at some point for an unknown offense, or possibly Cromwell got his father put in jail? It's not entirely clear, but (laughs) sick of his father's foul temper, Thomas Cromwell at about 15 or so runs away from home to seek his fortune. He stows away on a ship bound for the Low Countries, which is what they called the Netherlands at the time. Wandered around in France and the Netherlands, and he may have joined England's enemies in the French army for a while. He possibly served as a soldier servant and pike carrier, but no one's exactly sure about that. But a few years later, he surfaces, and I'm sorry if I mess this up, at the Battle of Garigliano, which was near Naples, and the French army suffered a huge defeat at the hands of the Spanish, and Cromwell fled the battlefield and went to Italy. Now he's pendulous still, again, and wandering again, but this time in Florence, where he makes friends with a member of a noble household. Well, not noble. They're a prominent banking family, so they're as close to noble as you can be without actually being noble. So, this prominent banking family in Italy sort of takes pity on him, and the sort of leader of the household sees Thomas Cromwell's potential, so he proves himself a loyal servant and works hard. On one trip with his master, he's left in Venice to act as an agent for a local merchant, so he's given a lot of trust and a lot of responsibility and makes some money, then he travels more and he travels more, he starts to practice law. He then becomes fluent in French and Italian and also has a good knowledge of Latin. He eventually returns to England and marries a widow from a family of the gentry, etc, etc. Basically, now think about 20 years of working your way up through the courts through some sort of manipulative means and some legitimate hard work and having a good brain attached to your shoulders. He knows that service to the king can bring ample rewards, so he helps King Henry devise a plan to break with Rome and destroy the Pope's power over his affairs, and that will enable him to divorce Catherine of Aragon. So all of this sort of political manipulation also has to do with the fact that King Henry doesn't want to be married to Catherine of Aragon anymore, and he helps him. Like, he's a personal advisor as much as he is a political advisor. Henry VIII. Yeah, Henry VIII, we're, if I didn't say that. We're just talking about a Henry lot of Henry, so it's going to be good to keep track of. <laughs> Yeah. It keeps going. The king wants an heir. He doesn't get an heir. So then there's another mistress and then there's a wife and it it keeps going. And all of this is sort of orchestrated by Thomas Cromwell. A lot of these stories you've heard in history class or in various lectures or whatever, but all of that stuff was pretty strongly orchestrated by Thomas Cromwell, which is not always super talked about. And then, so Cromwell is like at this point searching for a suitable fourth wife for the king. He is seeking an alliance with Germany. He becomes made the Earl of Essex, but he convinces the king to marry Anne of Cleves from Germany. And Henry VIII is disappointed by her looks when she finally arrives, and Cromwell says marry her anyway. And that was kind of like his last mistake, was forcing the king to marry a woman that he thought was not pretty. The marriage is a disaster, and in order to get it annulled, he has to give evidence in court of his failings in the bedroom. So like for a king, that's like a huge deal, that's super embarrassing. He's furious furious with Cromwell for setting up the marriage and basically in a court when the king is furious at you no one is standing
and they go, particularly for a former commoner. So he's charged with treason and corruption and executed at the Tower of London. Within weeks, Henry VIII was lamenting the loss of the most faithful servant he had ever had. That's sort of the story of Thomas Cromwell in a nutshell. You could go on and on and on with the ins and outs of political manipulation and wives and all of that, but... Basically, you did not mess with Henry VIII's libido. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That was always a bad move. Okay, let's start with, we rank the hotties in four categories. Those categories are mental attractiveness, physical attractiveness, social impact, and je ne sais quoi. Uh, So, Lindsay, why don't you start with physical attractiveness for your pick? Okay, so contradictory information about what Margaret looked like. When people described her, they mostly talked about uh, her personality and things she was doing. She wasn't described physically a lot. There is one letter where an envoy of the Duchess of Milan is describing her to the Duchess. Now, it's hard to tell how good looking she is because he's continually saying she's not as hot as the Duchess of Milan. So, (laughs) basically described her as... Everyone reports that the Queen of England is a very handsome woman, though not as handsome and fair as yourself. And when they were talking about fair and dark, and they meant in a literal sense, like not fair as in pretty, but fair as in light, um, colored. And the Duchess of Milan was like a white, blonde, pale person. So pretty much anybody is darker than her. She's usually depicted as graceful and pretty. She is also usually depicted as blonde, although one portrait that shows up in a prayer scroll that she commissioned herself has her with auburn hair and a couple of descriptions mention her as having red gold hair and it was also a tradition at the time to depict all queens as blonde so she might not have actually been blonde she might have had auburn hair and honestly with all the propaganda that got spewed about her afterwards if she had like a single physical fault i think they would have jumped on it like hardcore i do want to say for kind of all of these picks because obviously as anyone who watches game of thrones or is a study of the war of roses knows there's like a lot of slander campaigns happening here yes propaganda became a really big thing during the war of the roses on all sides yeah So what's your rating? I think she's a four. I think she sounds very attractive. I actually would lead more to the five if we knew for sure she had auburn hair because I think that that's... But I'm going to go with a four because there's some, you know, doubt. Okay, I'll agree with that. Um, I do think you're right. I think if there was something particularly ugly about her, we would know about it. Yeah, with the great detailing of all of her faults that the Yorkists did later on, I think we would know if she wasn't attractive. Yeah, so there is one surviving portrait of Thomas Cromwell, and it was painted by Hans Holbein. And it it's the first thing you think of if you think of anything about Thomas Cromwell, but also it's the only thing that really comes up when you Google him. But the portrait is not very flattering. It shows him as walking and wearing very plain clothes, although very expensive plain clothes. So it definitely has an air of intelligence to it, but it's also, he's pudgy and it's definitely unflattering. No, he is And there lumpy. is, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but there is some speculation that potentially vengeful Catholic in Queen Mary Tudor's reign after all of this stuff started to shake out might have been like a slander campaign. And there's speculation for there only to be one portrait of a man this powerful and having this much of King Henry VIII's ear. It's not likely that it would only be one portrait. Now it's possible there was only one portrait because he wasn't very attractive so no one wanted to look at him. But also it was uh, as much history and records as it was art for a lot of those historical portraits. So if there's no portraits that present him in any kind of kinder light. It might be because after his death and after King Henry VIII, people didn't want anyone to think of him as attractive. So they burned or destroyed any portraits that did present him in a good light. So he's definitely not an attractive guy. Sallow? Like, really sallow. Uh, Based on that one portrait. And there's really no accounts that I could find of anyone talking about what he looked like. It was all very much about his brain and his smarts and what he was able to talk people into doing. So I've got to say two at best. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to go with a one on this just because he's so like lumpy and sallow in the portrait of him. And I, I'm with you that it could easily be 
propaganda and part a big part of his image was that he was a Protestant and they were very against images. They didn't believe in portraits and icons and stuff like that. It could just be that there isn't good record of it, but based on what we know about him, I'm gonna have to give him a one. I think he's... I think uh, that's fine. That's fine and it's fair. Uh, I do think your benefit of the doubt is swaying in your favor for your pick and against me for my pick, but... Con- I mean, nobody described her a lot, but when they did, they always talked about her being attractive. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, that's like, fine. One is fine. One is fine. <laughs> okay, mental attractiveness. I think Margaret is very mentally attractive. She was incredibly intelligent and savvy, and she had a really great force of will, uh, which I find really attractive. She took control of stuff in a really desperate situation and for the most part navigated pretty well. There was definitely some mistakes later and I think she was a little bit blinded sometimes by her motivation to secure the throne for her son, which was very in doubt that that kind of made her make some rash decisions sometimes. But I think overall she really did, she was inspired by her mother and her grandmother who were both very politically savvy and powerful women. Fortunately, it did not go down as well in England as it goes in France, but she was often referred to as having a man's mind. This wasn't a particular compliment in the 1400s because you were supposed, like, a feminine disposition is part of what made a woman attractive. It was supposed to be very yielding. And the queen was only supposed to have two real roles, which was producing an heir and interceding with her husband. The queen would like formally intercede from a Christian feminine mercy place when the king was passing judgment on people and it was kind of a formalized pattern of excuse to lighten sentences where it didn't make the king look weak but could just say that he was acceding to sort of the mercy of the queen. She didn't play that very well. Now most of that was because her husband wasn't playing the strong part of that very well. I I just think she when they were waging all the wars with the Yorkists people even though she was often had allies that were men or was using the king's army. It was often referred to as the queen's army because she was the one doing all of the tactics and battle planning. And anyways, I just think she she clearly was smart and savvy and cunning. So I would say that she is a four out of five in mental attractiveness. I think that both of our picks have a lot of similarities in this category. This guy with a father that was on at least 48 court sheets of misdemeanors and growing up in rough back alleys to learn multiple languages, including Latin, to travel the world and, you know, befriend a merchant and then use that to parlay into this and use that to parlay into that and end up with a... One of the highest titles in the land, I think no one would argue that Thomas Cromwell had a lot going for him in the brain area. He's actually the reason why I picked him. And so, like, I agree with all of those things that you said, but grading on a curve for my pick, I think I'm going to say three and a half. I think on a scale of one to five for Thomas Cromwell and for her, I would agree with a four if it weren't for the fact that I think Thomas Cromwell had a little bit more going for him in how hard he worked to cultivate his mental acuity. Like, it wasn't just having the balls to be a lady in a man's job and taking charge when other people were not. And I think that's almost more like je ne sais quoi than it is mental attractiveness compared to having nothing and being essentially a child ruffian and teaching yourself multiple languages and court politics and working your way up that way. Yeah, no, I mean, I was going to give you that the most attractive thing about Thomas Cromwell is his brain. I was going to straight out going for a five and I mean I still am but now I'm feeling a little bitter about the three and a half <laughs> I just like I said I think if you if, if you put that into je ne sais quoi you would have gotten it but I think compared to Thomas Cromwell I'm just doing I'm doing a five and a three and a half okay did we hear back about whether half stars are are valid no we haven't heard yet okay so the jury's still out on half stars um, okay, so I mean, we both agree that Cromwell's brain is his is his long suit. Mm-hmm. So now let's talk about social impact. Very much like Game of Thrones, the show. There is an incredible amount of social impact, but also an incredible amount of none of this mattering. <laughs> So that's kind of hard for me to say because, like, it's all court manipulation and all of these court antics steered a lot of the course of Western history to some extent, but also none of it really mattered and how much did it really steer the course of Western history. So I'm actually a little bit torn on this for both of them because I think they both 
definitely had an effect. I think Thomas Cromwell basically getting Anne Boleyn locked away slash murder. I mean, I would say the biggest social impact he had was breaking with Rome. It was a lot of his work that resulted in... The, in the Church of England. Yeah, in, in England leaving the Holy Roman Empire. Um, in order to divorce eight women or however, 20 women, that's, however that's many how Henry got, VIII. Yeah, that's how you got Henry VIII to do anything. So <laughs> like, You can divorce somebody and then he was in. You can marry somebody new if you just break with Rome. I promise it'll be worth it. So, like, I definitely think, I definitely think you're right. I think that's by far the biggest impact that Thomas Cromwell had. I am not as familiar with your pick's historical impact. Um, I do think it's a pretty big impact to, to break with Rome. But I also, I don't know, maybe it's just because I find court politics boring and I always have and it's still my least, <laughs> least favorite part of Game of Thrones. I don't know, I think the uh, people just sitting in rooms drinking wine, plotting and hurling insults at each other is like my favorite part of Game of Thrones. Well, what are your votes for both both hotties? With Margaret, they've talked about how she's probably the most influential queen of England who ever ruled with a king. Obviously, yeah. like, Elizabeth, Victoria, you know, but, like, whoever was a co-ruler. But basically, outside of those ladies. She was the most influential on the course of history for England, in that, you know, the 30-year ongoing back and forth during the War of the Roses between the Lancasters and the Yorks really, in some ways, because they kept going back and forth, was just sort of this delayed thing. But she did keep the country together for quite a long time, when everybody agrees that Henry VI was pretty useless. Like, it might have even fallen to France in all of the sort of dispute if it hadn't been for her. Although, obviously, like, there's a strong chance that the Duke of York would have just come in and taken over. Like, he eventually did. And he ended up being the victor. She actually survived and ended up, her relatives, the Royal House of France, ransomed her. Um, and she ended up spending her last couple of years you know, back in, like, the Loire Valley and, and stuff like that. So she, she didn't actually die in the War of the Roses, which in and of itself is pretty impressive because, like, a lot of people did. So yeah. I would definitely say I'm torn about this because I do think breaking with Rome affected a lot of England's history, too. It definitely took them out of the whole, like, coalition of nations that was the Holy Roman Empire and, and made stuff very different for them. So if we're doing half star. <laughs> Which I don't usually do, um, but I would give her a four and a half, and I would give Thomas Cromwell a four. I think I'm giving people fours across the board for me. I think I think they both have a pretty large impact in their own ways, but I also think that both of their impacts, like, I don't think it's fives, just because in the grand scheme of history, it was important, and I think it changed a lot, but also things might have ended up going the same direction anyway. Yeah, no, I'm with you in that a lot of what they were involved in was court politics and and intrigue, which matters a great deal in the moment at the time, but doesn't really matter that as much in the long run, except how it affects like sort of the course of the, the country you're talking about. So yeah, um, I think it's really sick. I pick your pick is hotter than mine. <laughs> I'm just I'm just gonna say it like, yeah, it's probably not my guy. Well, if we were talking, if we were talking Cersei versus Littlefinger, I think I would have a little bit more skin in the game. Yeah, but Thomas Cromwell yeah. doesn't have a ton of je ne sais quoi. Littlefinger's got a lot more je ne sais quoi, like a lot more. But no, yeah, he's super creepy, but he's also super compelling. So I definitely am with you that if it was Littlefinger versus Cersei, I think Cersei's kind of like. I don't think she has a lot of. I don't know what. I think I know exactly what she has. <laughs> Yeah, and it's pretty brutal. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, I definitely think if we were talking Littlefinger versus Cersei, Littlefinger would be way more attractive in this category. But with the people we're talking about, even Margaret's enemies talked about her passion and her drive. And, uh, you know, even the slanders they threw at her, like the she-wolf of France, are kind of epic, even if they are slanders. So I, I definitely think I would give Margaret a four and I would give Cromwell a three. That's what I put down for me already for mine, so. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Cromwell might have been hurt by part of his, I mean, playing humble was a big part of what kept him safe yeah. when he was a person pushing into the aristocracy and the aristocracy is really not a fan of that. Absolutely. Yeah, that, 
I would say three and a four. Okay. Well, then we are in agreement there. Uh, so we have our winner, and by pretty much a landslide, it's Marco D'Anjou. Woohoo! I said that right, right? It's like the pair? Uh, yeah, because that's her family there in yeah. France, yeah. Yeah, the pear lady. The pear lady wins <laughs> with a score of 32 to 27. Of all the names Margaret's been called through the decades, I don't think the pear lady was ever one of them. <laughs> all right. But you've, you've added to her collection of uh, titles. Yeah, I, I think she should. I think she should go do that right now. Uh, I hope she's listening. Pear lady, if you're listening, get on Ghost that. Ghost pear lady. Okay, well, I think that's everything. So thank you very much for tuning in, listeners. And please, if you haven't yet, uh, rate and uh, leave a comment on iTunes. The more good ratings and the more comments that we get, uh, the easier it is for other people to find us. So it would very much help us out if you would subscribe, rate, leave a comment on iTunes. Even if you listen someplace else, it w- we would very much appreciate it. Yes, it would be great. Thank you. All right. And that's all for this episode of Historical Hotties. Bye. The